Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. We're so glad to have you here with us, uh, especially if you're visiting with us this morning. Thanks for being here. Special welcome to you. Uh, we want to invite you to worship with us together as we, uh, as we sing this first song together about God's grace. It is, his, it is his grace and his grace alone that saves us. Let's stand together and sing this. One, two, one, two. So that's what this uh, this song talks about here is um, 
is that on this day was the day um, that he made a way for us. So I'm going to ask you to, to join with us. Let's stand together as we sing this.
God, you made a way for us. That on that day, uh, when you laid down your life, that your body was broken and that you died, you died in my place, God. And so God, um, we thank you that God, there's this beautiful exchange. That you took our pain and our suffering and that God, um, we, we hand over our unrighteousness. We hand over our sin. And God, you would place upon us your righteousness. And you would make us white as snow. So God, thank you um, for your cross. Thank you for the ways that you have loved us and that you have exchanged my sin and my penalty, my death, God. And Father, thank you uh, that you love us so dearly and deeply. God, we desire uh, to love you more. So God, may we turn our hearts towards you this morning. Be open to hearing from you. In your name we pray these things. Amen. You may be seated. One of the deepest tragedies that I think uh, can happen to a Christian is when they get to a moment in their faith, when they start, to, they start to forget that it's about what God did for them. I think we've had plenty of those moments in our society. We've had people that have grown up in church world and they kind of isolate themselves from you know, those that drink and those that smoke and you know, those that uh, behave a certain way. And... Um, they start to think that they're better than those that also need Jesus Christ. I share that with you because that was the mentality of my family. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a heavy thing to share. I remember riding the church, fighting, punching, slapping my brothers, acting like heathens the whole way there. Some of you may have experienced that this morning. Just because your kids fight doesn't mean they're, they're, they're still heathens. They might be saints acting like sinners. That, that does happen in the family dynamic. But my family was a little bit different. And it wasn't just my immediate family. It was my grandparents. It was my uncles. It was my aunts. We had this mindset that we were better because we went to church and we called ourselves Christians and we lived in this little Christian bubble. We forgot that it's all about Jesus. We forgot that. And I think it's easy to forget that in our culture. We, we see so much going wrong on the news and on Facebook and social media. We see people's opinions and attitudes and we think, oh my gosh, what is wrong with them? Well, if you read your Bible, the same thing that was wrong with you before you met Jesus is still wrong with them. They need a Savior. And this is why we started this, this little bit of a study on regarding Jesus. We're in week eight of that study. Hopefully by now, if you've been reading the book along with us week to week as supplemental material, uh, and, and listen, let me, let me state this so that if this isn't obvious, uh, you, you get a picture of where we're coming from. There's so many scripture listed in that book. You're not just reading a guy's thoughts. You're not reading his opinion. You're not reading his preferences. You're reading his understanding of what the Bible teaches about Jesus. And he puts it in a very digestible format. So someone that has been previously exposed to church, maybe they grew up Catholic, maybe they walked away from the faith. This is the perfect tool to reintroduce them to Jesus. So we're in this study today. So many of you are praying uh, that, hey, Lord, show me who I can give this to, I can share my faith with. We know this is going to be a process. It's not going to be instantaneous. But, but for us this morning, if you're a Christian, there's some really good news I want, to, I want to remind you of. And it's this, Jesus's death has done for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. Do you know that this morning? You are not here because you're good or better than others. But the death of Jesus, he accomplished something for you that we couldn't do for ourselves. And that's one of the things that baptism is a picture of. And we're going to get into that in a little bit later. And so pride in ourselves, our goodness, our accomplishments, before the cross, it's not really an option. We should not be prideful in ourselves. We should be thankful and we should have pride in our God. And that's something that Paul has said more than once in his letters. That if I boast in anything, let it be me boasting in Jesus. So we're in this section, part eight. It talks about the meaning of Jesus' death. And what I, I've struggled with from week to week is, first couple weeks were easy. It's like, done. I know which 
which section we're going to look at in Scripture. But as, as you get along in this book, it, he covers so much, it's very broadly, not very deeply. So I just want to pick a passage to kind of sit on this morning. And, and I just want this to be a simple reminder for us. It's good news if you follow Jesus. But let me share with you this morning, as we read this text and we, we pull out a couple points, if you don't know Jesus, this does not apply to you. And my prayer is by the end of our time together, after hearing testimonies of how Jesus has changed lives, that maybe today would be the day where everything we find in this text does apply to you. That would be a great, great thing this morning. So we're in Romans chapter 5, picking up in verse 6. Paul, after talking about what suffering does for the believer, he reminds the Romans this truth. He says, for while we, was, we were still weak, at the t- right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person, one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if we, while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we now have received reconciliation. There's a couple simple points I want to pull out of that because it's so important. If you know Jesus, you don't forget these things. You don't want to slip into that attitude of pride because that's one of the criticisms that those that are far from God levy against the church. And one of the things that we have to own from time to time is sometimes they are right. Sometimes they're right. But may that not be true of us moving forward. And here's the first thing I want to share with you this morning. If you're on our app, is the first fill in the blank. Jesus made the first move. Jesus made the first move towards us. You ever dated someone for a long time and you start to think back like, who asked who out? Who showed interest in who first? Jesus made the first move towards us. See, Jesus died for us even when we opposed him. See, when we think about our faith, uh, it, it, we get shaped so much by the media that's around us. And, and there's some movements in our culture of, of people that call themselves Christians. They play a lot of music that isn't very theologically deep. And, and there's a place for emotionally driven music because the faith is an emotional thing, but it's not only an emotional thing. It's not primarily an emotional thing, but, but there's a lot of what you would call prom songs to God. And there's no theological uh, truth in them or richness in them. And and there's songs that you could not just sing to God, but maybe to your significant other because Jesus and God and all those important names that he has are missing. And and so we often, we, we, we take that mentality into our thinking, understanding our faith, and we start to make this caricature of God who's like this junior high kid trying to get someone's attention that he's interested in. But, but that's not what Jesus did at all. He, he wasn't waiting for us to come to him because he knew that would never happen. He made the first move. Look at verse 6. You see this word, for while we were still weak. That, that has a bigger meaning than, you know, like you just, you just ripped off a bunch of reps or you just ran a mile or two and you feel weak after. This is actually in the Greek uh, demonstrating that we were unable to do anything to improve our condition. Think about a child that gets left on a changing table, Lord forbid, because bad things happen there. Child starts crying. Can the child do anything other than cry to save himself? No, he needs a parent to come and change the diaper and redress and you know, maybe feed them. A, a child is completely helpless, unable to improve their condition. That's why sometimes babies, all they do is cry. And they cry all night until you figure out what's going on with them. We were like that before God. There was nothing we could do to improve our condition. We read in Romans chapter 3, verses 10 through 12, it says, As it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. 
No one understands. No one seeks for God. No one is out there saying, gee, God is out there somewhere. I got to find him unless the Holy Spirit had put that into their heart to begin with so that they would look for God. And, and remember this, if God put the Holy Spirit in you to draw you to himself, that's God making the first move. He made the first move by dying. He made the first move by sending his Holy Spirit. He made the first move. He goes on to, on to say, uh, quoting the Old Testament, all have turned aside together. They have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Sometimes in Christian circles, we, we tend to forget that that was the state that we were in when God found us, and we like to show off our resume. And, and when you read the Old Testament, you realize all our righteousness was filthy before God. Jesus made the first move. He made the first move towards you. He made the first move towards me. He gets the credit. Our salvation is about him and not about us. This is where I lose my mind when we walk into debates about free will and did God choose, did we choose God? Listen, I, I, I think we're a sensible enough church that if you call yourself an Arminian, uh, you want to say, well, I chose God and that's how you understand your salvation. Just remember he made the first move. You don't want to go too far down that road because then all of a sudden you, you worship a God that's not sovereign. And if he's not sovereign, he's not really God anymore. And, and if you are a person who leans the other way and says, it's all about what God did, you know, praise be to God. God did this wonderful thing in you, but we can't become like some of the, the reformed people that I encountered in college that didn't even see the value in youth ministry because it was all about the covenant family. And one time I was really puzzled with an individual. I said, well, what about those that God might want to save that don't have Christian parents? He said, what about them? They're not elect. And we don't want to get cold and become stupid and at the same time disobedient because God has called us to make disciples. And what we have to remember, and while we're patient and praying for others, it's not about them choosing God. It's about God saving them. God made the first move. And all of life should be understood through this prism. It's not about us. Everything we do needs to be all about him. Here's the second point. We get credit for the good we did not do. We get credit for good we did not do. Look at verse 9. It says, since therefore we have now been justified by his blood. Have you ever had someone steal credit from you? You're in school, you know the right answer, you whisper it out loud, and that, that goof-off kid or know-it-all kid, here's what you said, their hand goes up, and they get the credit, and you're like, I want to punch you, or I'm going to spread a rumor about you, or I'm going to take you down during kickball, you know, something like that goes through your mind, because those people that steal credit drive us crazy. They drive us crazy. But here's the deal, we're not stealing credit from God in this case. We're receiving credit for good we did not do. That is great news because when you think about being washed clean of sin, it's not just sins of commission, things we do and laws that we break and ways we dishonor God. There's what we call sins of omission, meaning we, we know to do good and don't do it. So we have to live out a life of righteousness. It's not just stop doing bad things. It's about starting to do the right things and honoring God by obeying his commands and showing his nature to those around us. Because we couldn't do that and Jesus made the first new move towards us, we receive goodness we did not accomplish. Now think about this just for a moment. There are two parts of this big theological term called justification. There's a, the, the aspect that first and foremost, you were justified. Think about uh, the way we taught young people this for years, just as if you've never sinned. Uh, it's a literally a legal pardon from God the judge saying, hey, you're no longer guilty for your sin. Your sin has been covered by Jesus. And John made reference to that during the worship time together. But also, it's what we call imputed righteousness. Righteousness given to you from above that you didn't earn. So when God declares, hey, you're no longer a sinner, you're saved by the blood of Jesus, you're also receiving the righteousness of Christ so that you can stand before a holy God and you can live differently. See, when Jesus went to this cross, as we sang this morning, he took our sin our shame, and our punishment. He exchanged it. He, he took that from us, and our exchange was we got his goodness, his righteousness, his moral standing. If you're wondering, what does that word righteousness mean? It just means that you're morally good. 
We have a lot of talk in culture today about who's good, who's not good. Well, first of all, only Jesus is good. Let's keep that straight in our thinking. It's not about political decisions necessarily, but we have to get underneath that and say, who is good? Only Jesus. And, and Paul clears this up when he says, 2 Corinthians 5.21, for, he, for our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin. So Jesus, who never committed a sin, was never guilty of a sin, thought, deed, action, omission, he became sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. We receive a righteousness that is not ours. Martin Luther wrote way back in 1883, and this has come up on the screen. He talks about what many theologians refer to as the great exchange in his writing it is translated wonderful exchange. He writes, that is the mystery in w- which is rich in divine grace to sinners, wherein by a wonderful exchange our sins are no longer ours, but Christ and the righteousness of Christ is not Christ but ours. He has emptied himself of his righteousness, that he might clothe us with it and fill us with it. And he has taken our evils upon himself that he might deliver us from them. In the same manner as he grieved and suffered in our sins and was confounded in the same manner, we rejoice in glory in his righteousness. If you are a follower of Jesus this morning, you are pardoned for your sin and you get credit for the righteous life that Jesus lived while he was on this earth. That is great news. That is why we sing. That is why we celebrate. What I want you to see in verse 9, part B, is our third point. God is no longer angry with you. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, God is no longer angry with you. Think for a moment. What's the longest grudge you've ever held? Who's made you the angriest in your life? I uh, talked to different family members, different families. I talked to my own family and my wife's extended family, I don't know names, but there are people that were mad because they weren't invited to so-and-so's wedding, and they held a grudge for so long, years later, things should have been better. They're like, well, we're not inviting them to our kid's wedding. It's like, wow, how mature. It's great we can all be adults in this situation. But think about the person that's made you the angriest. Maybe it's that kid in your house who has a trait that is identical to your own, And their behavior reminds you of that weakness that you have, and that's why you get so fired up. And you think, this kid just drives me insane. Or maybe it's a relationship, uh, someone that you've called a friend that that betrayed you, hurt you, angered you. Well, think about that. And, And all of those situations pale in response to God's angry at sin and anger at law breaking. Listen, it's not popular to talk about an angry God. But but why would God be only loving in a world that tolerates sex crimes? Why would God only be loving in a world that tolerates brutality towards children? Why would God only tolerate when when rich and wealthy try to control the culture by, uh, by the things that they do to just hoard more wealth? Why would God only be loving towards a culture that allows so many to starve? Why would God only be loving when there are believers that don't want to share their faith and share their good gift of their salvation to those that are closest to them? Why would God only have that trait? Why would that be his defining trait? Well, when we read the Bible, we we remember the, the, the most defining trait about Jesus is the fact that he is holy and righteous and good, and he is angry at sin, and his anger burns against sin. In Romans chapter 2, verse 5, Paul reminds us, but because of your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. There there is a day when Jesus will return and true believers, they'll rejoice. Their Savior is here. He's appeared. He's come to rescue us. But those who are not saved, they will fight and they will lose and they will experience the wrath of God. If you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus, God is still angry at you in your sin. He's still angry. And it says in the Bible, you're storing up more and more anger because you continue in your sin. So we understand and we teach at Bridge Bible Church that if we don't repent of our sin, turn to Jesus, that anger, when it's revealed, won't all just be revealed on the day of judgment. But we know that God's angry wrath 
burns against the unrepentant forever. That's what hell is. God's angry wrath burning against the unrepentant. We read in Revelation chapter 20, verses 14 and 15. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. And we know from our, the Bible that that lasts forever. The good news is if you are saved, you don't have to fear God's angry wrath. Even when you make mistakes, you don't have to think, oh man, I'm going to pay for this. Or, or when you make a mistake, you don't have to go, man, he's up there, he's disappointed, he's angry. We used to joke about, hey, if he wanted to, he could just lightning bolt you. Do you ever have someone say something ridiculous and you're like, I'm going to move over here. I'm not going to catch the lightning bolt that's coming your way. But that's not true. In fact, when you sin and you experience consequence as a Christian, that's because God wants to teach you and form you and help you to be more like Jesus. He's not there. He's not angry with you if you've repented of your sin. If you have re not repented, I encourage you to repent so that God's anger will be kept from you. Number four, we are no longer God's enemies. We are no longer God's enemies if we are a Christian because of the death of Jesus. Look at verse 10 again. For while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Jesus' death was a sacrifice that was made to bring us peace with God, to reconcile us with God. And we have to understand that what that means is we are kind of here as God's chosen people behind enemy lines, hoping to find more that were his enemies that become his followers, that become part of his family. And because of what Jesus has done, and that we're saved by his death, we're also going to be saved by, the, by his life. We look forward to a day where we are resurrected like Jesus was. We rejoice in what he did for us. And we understand that, that when reconciliation happens, here, here's what we, we get wrong on earth. Forgiveness is one thing, rec reconciliation is another, and restoration is the final step. Forgiveness, when, when a broken relationship occurs, that happens immediately. So, so when, when you came to faith and you said, Lord Jesus, I believe that you lived, you lived on earth, you died on the cross for my sin, you rose again, that God raised you up, that you were God in the flesh, you're returning someday. When you say that, you are immediately forgiven before God. Now, in human relationships, we're called to forgive immediately. And sometimes it takes a lot of work because there's a lot of hurt that's been done. But forgiveness doesn't mean that the relationship is automatically back to normal. In fact, a lot of times when we forgive, we have to wait for the other party to repent so reconciliation can happen. So in a global sense, when Jesus died, he forgave all those that were going to be saved, but weren't yet reconciled until that moment of repentance and forgiveness was received. In human relationships, you can't have reconciliation unless there's repentance on the offending party. And that's hard for us to remember that. And you're, it's okay to say, hey, I forgive you, but we can't continue in this relationship until we can agree on some things. That's actually godly, that's healthy, and that, that's called just living with boundaries. Restoration is something else. It's kind of the third step when the relationship is restored. Restoration is, hey, something was broken and something needs to be put back together. Sometimes in a relationship that happens, if you let your wife down on your you know, anniversary and you forget to buy flowers, you make it up, you buy a whole lot of flowers and you take her to a nice dinner. You're making up for you. Something was broken and you're paying some sort of restitution. In our case, our restitution was paid towards God by the blood of Jesus. But we have to understand those three terms, forgiveness, reconciliation, and restoration. We rejoice because of what Jesus did for us, we are no longer his enemies. Let me give you a couple things we should do because of these truths. Here's the first one. We should walk in humility. As believers in Jesus, we should always walk in humility. We need to deal with our families. We need to deal with our relationships. We need to deal with one another very humbly. And sometimes because of things we've experienced, it's hard to do that. Our, our pride gets in the way. Ways we've been hurt kind of seep back up to the surface and we forget to deal with each other in humility. See, when we take pride in our own spiritual accomplishments, our own perceived goodness, meaning we think we're good when we're not, our good works or even our Christian service, when we take pride in those things, we're not walking in humility. It becomes a, a look at me show. Well, Titus chapter three 
Paul writes, he saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy. So if you're here and you think you did something to earn God's favor, you got to realize it's about his mercy. He held back his anger and his wrath from you by diverting it to Jesus. And and the good things we do are a response and, and they should never make us proud. We should walk in humility. Second thing we should do is we should always walk in gratitude towards God. We should show him gratitude by how we order our lives, how we spend our time. We need to walk in the works that he prepared for us before the foundations of the earth. Ephesians reminds us of that. We show God gratitude as men, how we lead and love our families. Listen, we got to get to a point, guys, where it's not about us. It's not about our hobbies. It's not about our desires. We want to lead our kids towards Jesus, love our wives towards Jesus. We want our families to thrive and honor God that way. How we handle our studies if we're a student how we do our work, and even how we order our finances. Now, if you're hearing that, you're thinking, oh, he just wants more money. That's not true. Here's the deal with finances. I know a lot of people that do a lot of good with some of their money, but what they do is they use the rest very selfishly and sometimes sinfully. We talk about ordering your finances to please God. It means you recognize, first and foremost, everything you have is his, and there may be things that you're spending on that don't please him that you need to think, how can I make my entire life submissive to him? And by doing that, you're showing him gratitude. Third thing is we need to live joyfully. As a church, I I know there's a lot of people that are fearful of what's coming in culture. And and sometimes it's like the writing's on the wall. You see all these memes about government, uh, even some memes about our president. Uh, That should not be something we ignore, but that shouldn't be something that robs us of joy either. Our joy is in Jesus Our kingdom is somewhere else. We are citizens of a kingdom that is not the United States. We want to do our best to affect change, to preserve morality, to lift up Jesus. But in the end, we should not be in despair because of what we see. Finally, we need to be at peace. No matter what happens in this life, our eternity is secure if we belong to Jesus. I've shared this before, and I want to give credit where credit's due. My youth pastor used to always say, for the believer in Jesus, this life, no matter how bad it gets, will be as close to hell as they ever get. But for those who don't believe in Jesus, this life, as bad as it can be, and maybe those glimpses of goodness is as close to heaven as they will ever get. We need to be at peace, and we need to be motivated to share our faith with others. If you are a follower of Jesus repented of your sin, believe he died, was buried, and rose again. You can do these things because you have the Spirit of God living in you. And all it takes is to submit to that Spirit and to walk in humility, show God gratitude, live joyfully, and be at peace. Sometimes Christians can be the loudest complainers when we should be the most gracious and demonstrate the most gratitude. That is something we need to start walking out. But I want to remind you, if you don't follow Jesus, if you've never repented of your sin, agreed with God that only he is good and that you need salvation, not only these things that you can't do, maybe outwardly you can attempt them, but they're not going to be true of who you are in essence, but you are not saved by the death of Jesus.